We just have to get out there and really talk to the people and hear their voices. What are their hopes, their dreams? What are their fears? What are their challenges? And how do they see government trying to help to change their material conditions? If you believe we can change the narrative, if you believe we can change our communities, if you believe we can change the outcomes, then we can change the world. I'm Rob Richardson. Welcome to Disruption Now. Welcome to Disruption Now. I'm your host and moderator, Rob Richardson. With me is the uh, fighter, one of the one of the best fighters I know, St State Senator uh, uh, Nita Turner, who is uh, running for Congress in Cleveland. And um, what is the congressional district you're running in? The 11th Congressional District, and that is portions of Greater Cleveland, with Cleveland being the major city, and portions of Greater Akron, with, of course, Akron being the major city. We have suburban communities surrounding that Greater Cleveland, Greater Akron area. And we, we, we both are alumni to running statewide in Ohio. And uh, <laughs> we have the uh, experience and bruises, but we still kept fighting. We still kept moving forward. Uh, you're a great supporter of mine during, the, uh, during my run. <clears throat> I thank you for all your advice and all your support. Uh, it's not easy running in Ohio. And, and so like, first of all, thank you for, I wanna say thank you for doing what you're doing and continuing and being involved. Um, uh, people give people running for office and public service a really hard time. And this is a really difficult time to be running for public office. And um, so my first question to you is why? Why in the world are you running for office when you could you could be doing other things like you were you were certainly helping behind the scenes and, uh, you know, helping candidates, which is honorable. But now you want to get back into it yourself. Like, why? Why do you want to do this in this toxic, crazy environment? Why, why would you want to put yourself through this? I think that's the question I have to ask because it's a lot to put yourself through. It is, Robin. Thank you for lifting up. I mean, we both do just if I can just pause. Because I think it's important for people to know that people like you and me did get into the arena. You know, FDR has this great long quote about being the man in the arena. And I want to add woman to that, you know, humankind. We were in that arena. And he goes on to talk about, you know, we got the bruises and the scars and all of that kind of stuff. Now, I'm paraphrasing. But his message was to those who criticize, who ain't never did anything or, or dare to be in that kind of arena. So it's not us it is the people who just sit back and and uh, complain and bemoan and try to find things are wrong that are wrong versus people like us who actually get in there to try to be in the words of Mahanta Gandhi the change that we want to see in the world so i do want to applaud you and all of the particularly african american people who came before us absolutely uh, and them are still walking around right now yeah in, in either Columbus or Cincinnati or Cleveland, they laid a strong foundation for people like you and me, the Charlita, the Charlita Tavares, Senator Tavares of the world, the, the the Sykes of the world, you know, absolutely uh, Barbara, Barbara Sykes and et cetera, et cetera. You know where I'm coming from. So I, I don't think we should gloss over that. It is very important that you ran for treasurer. It's very important that I ran for secretary of state. No question. And although we didn't necessarily win those races. We created we softened the soil for yeah. others who are going to come after us and that is vitally important so thank you for taking that risk i mean why now i would say why not now the needs are great and i do think that for a time such as this a personality like mine the work that i've done not only in our state but all across this country whether i'm standing up for medicare for all for this district the state and the nation or, you know, I'm fighting to make sure that people have clean air, clean water, clean food. It is time. This this moment is just is, is it is ripe for people who are going to to be not only speakers of the truth, but also doers of the deed. And I am that person. I do. It is very toxic. You know, I do have my days like anybody. I'm sure you had yeah. your days. Too. I, have, I had a few of them. Question yourself. <laughs> like, why am I doing this? Right. <laughs> I had those days. I had those days. Yes, right. I definitely did. But what, if I can get to, you've got to why right now a little bit. I want to talk to you about why, though. Why are you doing public service, period? Like, what is your why, your central motivation beyond? You talk about the things you want to solve, which I, I hear you, you know, Medicare for all. But like what? There's a lot of ways to solve problems. And the, polit the political arena is one. Why do you feel like you're doing this in the political arena is the question. 
I, I think it's my ministry. I mean, I see politics as a ministry. Many people might not see it that way. I don't think that you can serve that which you do not love. And so I've been in the vineyard, both as an active politician, meaning, you know, fully elected, and now somebody who is the honorable. I, I never stopped. So even though I haven't been actively elected since 2014, I never stopped doing the people's work. And there is a certain type of element and power to being elected. You can navigate uh, the the forces a little differently than you can j as an activist. And to me, both of those forces are necessary. We need inside pressure and we also need outside pressure. The journey that I've had thus far, especially over the last almost seven years, I think was preparing me even more, Rob, for this particular moment to run for this seat and to use all that I have learned, the relationships that I have earned to be able to tilt the body politic towards the poor, the working poor and the barely middle class. It's, it's just on me. I don't know if people who are joining us in this conversation right now ever had that thing you know, it was driving you, it was calling yeah. you, and you just you just couldn't shake it. And so that's what this is for me. It is part of my ministry. Yeah. So um, you talked about having pressure from the inside and outside, and that brings me to a, a question I want to ask. You were uh, when you when you were uh, with uh, our revolution, you were pretty critical of uh, the current president. Now, um, uh, not more critical than Trump. Let me make that clear. But you were critical about some things. Um, and I do, uh, I do agree with the inside and outside pressures. So this is a two-part question. How do you see yourself working with the administration in terms of moving forward, but also holding them accountable? Because I think both are necessary. How do you, how do you navigate that and, and figure out that balance? Does, does my question make sense? No, it does. I mean, we're going to work together fantastically. I'm actually looking forward to working with this administration. The two things that you name, how do you work with, but also hold accountable or keep a certain force so that we keep moving in the right direction. Those things are not diametrically opposed. They actually go together. It is the job of a leader. And especially if you are elected to a legislative body to push the executive, to push the administrative branch or the executive branch of government. The job is not just to go along to get along, but it right. is to be there to advocate for the needs of your constituents. And there are gonna be times when we are in full agreement. For example, the, the COVID relief bill, the $1.9 trillion, I thought certainly that was a very good start. The child tax credits that are within that, that you know, is passed, that was in that policy plank, very good. The monies that are coming to uh, state governments and local governments, very good. The $1,400, by example, good. It could have been very good if it was the whole $2,000 plus trying to frame and find ways to continue to shore people up during this pandemic, which we, as you know, have not faced for a hundred years, anything yeah. of this supernatural magnitude and the suffering was there before the pandemic and rob that really is my critique is that we can't act as though the fistigers in this system whether they're racial or economic or gender based or identity based i mean you name it those things those isms those human challenges were present oh absolutely i think i think the i think the uh pandemic both exposed those uh exposed them in a way that people didn't People saw more than they used to, and yeah. it also accelerated trying to make things worse. Right. So when you, uh, when 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 school had to go remote, if you didn't have access to an internet, if you didn't have good broadband access, you were already behind. If you didn't have that type of support system, you know, as an example, if you're a, if you're a working mother who had to go and figure out how to take care of the kids, you had to do that and be there to watch the kids and actually do their schooling. That wasn't possible for someone who had to be the people we called essential workers and then underpaid them. So I, I completely agree with you. That's right. So that's that's it. You know, where we agree, I will be the first one to say it and out there pushing and, and, and being a champion. And when we do not agree, I am actually going to critique and go to Congress to get all that I can for the constituents who put me there. I do have the courage to ask for more. And, and the model that I'm using is not foreign to the 11th Congressional District. If you look at all the other Congress people who came before the Congressman, you know, Louis Stokes, who in fact, Rob, as you know, yes. was the first black congressperson in the entire state of Ohio. Yep. How was that done? They pushed the status quo to say, wait a minute, what's going on right now is right. 
the African American community does not have representation. Had he and his brother, Congressman Stokes, by way of example, just went along to go get along, we would not have never had that seat. And what did that seat do? It paved the pathway for another seat to come along, which yep. is the seat that is in 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 Columbus right now. Just another opportunity. But the 11th congressional district, which was the 21st congressional district, is the only majority minority district in the state of Ohio. And even that because of demographics may not be the case in 2022. And then you also have Congresswoman Marsha Fudge, who's now Secretary of HUD, which I am excited about for our state, You know, not just my district, but our yeah. state that we share and love in common. But even when she was the president of the Congressional Black Caucus, and she was asked a question about challenging then President Barack Obama, and I'm paraphrasing her, but she made it very clear, as I am right now, when we agree with the president, we agree. And when we don't agree, we're going to say so. Yeah. So what is it, you know, one of the issues, I think, in terms of Ohio and, and, and why progressives and Democrats have a hard time getting elected statewide is that we don't do, from my perspective, a good enough job in um, activating our base, working with our base, understanding our base, framing the issues around and fighting for them and having a long term engagement with them. In Cleveland, you talked about when you talked about our uh, our ancestors and folks that really helped build like like the Lewis Stokes of the world. I agree with you. They definitely built a foundation for us to be here. I will say after them, my perspective is that for whatever reasons and a whole bunch of reasons, there was there, there was some drop off. And I can tell you this and I can give my honest perspective from Cleveland. I didn't I didn't feel like we, we were we, we didn't have people activated and inspired in a way Um for us to really make sure that we can do what Georgia did, like really have people engaged. Uh, you got, when people have a mayor's race, like no one, zero, almost no one comes out. Like it's like, I believe it was something miserable below 10%. And you got a whole sets of folks that seem to uh, feel hopelessness when it comes to their government, who represents them. At least that's, that's my, that's my, that's my perspective from, even though I don't live in Cleveland, I spent a lot of time there running when I ran for statewide office. What do you think you can do well, you can, I don't know if you agree with that assessment, one. But I do. If you do, if you do <laughs> what do you think can be done um, from your position if you get elected to help really change that? So really, one is just really simple is to get out there among the people. And I know with COVID and us trying to figure out what's the right, you know, how do we continue to be safe and also be 3D again? But yeah, I know, right? <laughs> but it's, it's old fashioned. I mean, we do, I just see promise in the problem. And to me, the promise is we can certainly find ways to do things differently. And matters of the heart actually matter. We're not gonna penetrate people through through the head. You gotta penetrate them through the heart first and then that percolates to the head. And what I mean by that is that we just have to get out there and really talk to the people and hear their voices. What are their hopes, their dreams? What are their fears? What are their challenges? And how do they see government trying to help to change their material conditions? Right? I believe that one of the reasons why people don't turn out to vote, especially in areas where the social and economic challenges are really, really heavy, is because they have not seen changes in their material lives. And so from a logical standpoint, maybe not to you and I, because we're, you know, we believe in the power of government. That's why you and I both have run and other people have ran to really change that and force power to answer to the needs of the people. But if you go year after year after year, and it's really not answering to your needs, even even just even just superficially answering to your needs, right. you can throw your hands up and say, why am I doing this anymore? That's logical. That, that makes sense. Right. So Democrats are going to have to do a better job of not just talking to the people, but talking with the people and really centering and understanding where they're coming from. And by extension, I would say that our state voted for Senator Obama and then President Obama twice, two times. Yeah. I believe we still have that muscle memory and that we can do things differently. But we got to travel the state and answer to the cries of the people and not get so offended when folks have when they start to critique our party. Yeah. Yeah, we've never done an autopsy, so to speak, too. Yeah, but like a real deep seated. What are the things we do right? What are the things we do wrong? And how can we make changes so that people are more motivated to come out the vote? Yeah, I mean, you talk. It is, it is matters of the heart. Uh, I believe you're right, and I believe it also has to do with you know knowing how to frame things from conviction. And I and I think often we, you know, I'm saying we will Democrats try to frame things from. 
uh, from a way that, okay, how do I do this in the least offensive way? Or how do I do this in a way that, 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 that I can thread the needle. And what I tell people is I'm, I'm not against moderates. I think everything in moderation, including moderation, some things, <laughs> right? Some things you got to have some conviction for at some point, right? So you got to have like, so it, it's, it's good. You could, uh, I got no problem being a moderate, but what, what is it that you are willing to walk over fire for? People have to feel that and you got to, you got to be able to express that. So what do you think in terms of how do we get ourselves to, to frame the narrative better? Like, what are some issues? How would you do it? How would you help lead that? Because I, I do think we do it very poorly. And I'll just say this um, to go back to my experience. I remember when we ran for statewide office and I uh, can't remember the name of the bill. I think it was issue one. And it was talking about reforming the criminal justice system. Actually, very a, a very popular thing to do when you talk about it. But of course, uh, you know, uh, some Democrats did a poll. They said, well, it's going to pull bad. I said, of course, it's going to pull bad if you talk about it like that. So someone asked me, uh, like, well, why do you support this? I said, well, he, you know, because, you know, is this the right way to do it? I said, well, to have a constitutional amendment. I said, I guess the better way to do it is to have legislators do their job, but they haven't done it. So like, I, and then when I answer it that way, you know, I have some people at the party say, that's a really good way to answer it. Say, so, yes, that's how you answer with conviction versus being scared. How do we get them to understand this? And, and hopefully that'll help them. I don't know when more, but how do we, how do we understand like how to frame the narrative and get it right versus having them frame the narrative against us? Authenticity matters to people and they know, I mean, even I'm, I'm sure you have encountered people and folks that are joining us on this conversation journey this, this today, you have people who don't agree with you. Yeah. What's the first thing you want them to say is, you know what? I don't agree with him, but he is convicted. I, I felt his authenticity. He told me the truth or she told me the truth. That's really what you want. I mean, the goal is not, you're never going to get 100% agreement. If two people always agree, I think this is a, a Chinese proverb, one is not needed. <laughs> That's true. I mean, it really is through the debate, debate process and the exchange of ideas and the getting of understanding that we can open up bridges of opportunity, but not to be so afraid afraid to offend people that now not only are you not telling the truth but you got revisionist history yeah you know, you know when i think about critical race theory and how you know some republicans are just trying to erase the drama trauma and inhumanity of chattel slavery or the stealing of the native american hey, senator turner they're, they're trying to erase january 6. <laughs> right, <laughs> like, right, right. right i mean like they're trying to erase like a few months back That's like true. it didn't happen i mean you know it's True. And it's True. what happens when you let folks, and I say that I feel really passionate about this, um, because at the end of the day, a lot of the debates we have matter, but some of them don't. Like what, 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 what we have is we have a whole side of this country, a political party that is willing to just destroy the truth and keep power. And I think the mistake we make is, okay, let's figure out how to negotiate with people that are trying to support uh, insurrectionists. Like, there is no negotiate. At this point, we have to figure out how we can frame the narrative to bring people along to make them understand what has happened. Uh, I mean, I, I, how do we fight this propaganda machine? Because I, I also want to go back to that, because I think Republicans are so good at this, right? Yeah. They really are. Like, they know how to speak to their base and figure out how to motivate them. You go back to 2018, the, the biggest issue for first-time Republicans, do you know what it was? It, it, was, it was it was immigration <laughs> because because uh, President Trump spent like six months talking about people in Central America are coming over. And then once that was over, you never hear about that again. But they're able to trigger, trigger and make them believe now they believe, you know, false conspiracies about the coronavirus, whatever it is. And they're so good at that. And I think not understanding how big of a threat that is where you have people that believe whole realities that are not true. And, 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 and then we're trying to fight them to say we can reason with people or some people we can't reason with. We got to figure out how to fight the propaganda we're going against. I mean, I don't know if you have an opinion on this about how we really tackle this, the, the strong right wing propaganda that is so dangerous, I think, to this country. Yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. They're just we just got to Confession is good for the soul. <laughs> there are some people and hopefully that group is very small. That would be our hope. There are some people that you just can't reason with. And yeah. we got to be OK with that. I also believe that there are some people that given more information and, and convicting again, their heart, like connecting with them, not on a head level, but on a heart level. Yeah. What is it that I could say to them to at least cause them the pause and just think, even if they never come all the way to me, that is the group. 
And then by extension, the group of people who are already predisposed to be with us. When we talk about justice, what does that look like? Well, if you are a, a, far, a family farmer, for example, in Iowa, what justice looks like for you is not to be overran by factory farms, by yeah, corporate yeah. farming. Even though that population is mainly white and mainly rural, when you drive down some, I mean, Rob, driving down the highway where the stench is so thick yeah. that you can cut it from these factory farms, talking to people who can't put their clothes out on, on, a, on a hanger if they wanted to, or only could come outside at a certain time of the day, or have the, the residue on their homes. Think about yeah. that. And so what matters to that group of people? And even though they may lean a little more conservative, I will tell you, as I traveled this country with Senator Sanders and was able to have these conversations, the number one thing that was animating family farmers, people may be shocked to hear this, was health care. And you know right. why? Because the cost of health care for them is an extraordinary burden like it is yep. on Americans. And if they are married, one spouse has to work a regular job to get health care so that then they can keep the farm going. So yeah. health care, universal health care was something that was very important to them on the that might not seem like you. I mean, you would have never probably guessed that most people. But now talking it through you, that makes a whole lot of sense. So am I walking up to those people talking about progressivism just straight? No. I'm talking to them about their particular needs. And in that need, yeah. we find commonality. No, I completely agree. And, that, and that's the way they approach it. Uh, so let's say the election goes like you want. What's the most important? What's the what's the number one thing you want to accomplish within your first term that you can say that you can go back to people and say, this is what we accomplished? Yeah, twofold. One definitely is is pushing and, and joining on legislation that I think will change the material conditions of the residents of the 11th Congressional District, our state and nation by extension. And I always say those three things only because it's very few things that a member of Congress does that only impacts their district. Sure. It is we're, we're connected here. Congress handles national and also international. So it's all of those things, even though we're elected from a district. And then back to something else that, that you and I have been, been talking through, talking about and weaving through this entire conversation is the heart of the matter. I yeah. want to, I am going to get out into this community and let people know, first of all, thank you. And I'm here to serve you. And I, I am going to go on listening tours to hear what people have to say, both their hopes, their dreams, their fears, and, 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 and how they see the future and how they see themselves in the future to try to motivate people that although things look bleak and in some cases they really are, this is not yeah. just something you yeah. make it up in your yeah. head, it's yeah. real. But just because it is reality in this moment, if we plan, if we plot, plan, strategize, organize, and mobilize to quote a dear friend of mine, Killer Mike, Michael Rinder, then what is the reality today does not have to be the reality tomorrow. Preach. So I want to do a heart soul tour to really tap in and then take all of that and, and, and have that continue to fuel me as I serve and try to push policies that will change material conditions. All right. Um, I want to, I want to switch to a little more uh, personal questions uh, for you. Uh, can you think about a time that you failed in your life? Doesn't have to be politically. It could be professionally, personally, however you want to talk about it and how that ended up being a lesson for you and helping you more in the future? Yeah, I'm stuck on the political side, but I was- <laughs> That's fine, you can do the political side. <laughs> you know, running for Secretary of State, I would not call that a failure because I took the risk and I knew that it was gonna be like walking through hell with gasoline clothing on. Yeah. And I didn't win the race. So if people wanna purely say, well, you lost, I did lose the race, but in that I gained a whole lot. And I, and I believe, I really do believe that I educated a lot of people across this state. And, but for my presence and running, things would have been uh, different. And we need to definitely redefine what losing means. I mean, you ran too, you didn't win the race, but your very presence changed things. Absolutely. It, 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 it's the same thing, you know, even in looking at the presidential election, I mean, you and, and folks know who my candidate was side by side both times he ran. Yeah, he didn't win the race, but the progressive movement has definitely changed the political mood, the, not only the mood, but what is on the agenda. We're talking about legalizing marijuana. I mean, Biden about, is way more progressive because of it. Let's, let, let, yes, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So to me, that is a win. And so we have to find 
the positives, even when something does not go exactly the way you wanted it to go. And then I will say, you and know, I, I have a quick, quick quote uh, that, that Eric Thomas, a friend of mine, said, you don't you don't lose because you lost. You lost because you quit. That's about also going forward and oh. figuring out the opportunities with because your loss is really an opportunity to learn. And I've had much greater opportunities that I wouldn't have had, but for my run, too. So go ahead. No, I, I, I totally agree with you. And just to pull something from the personal side, too is, you know, growing up in a, in a work, a family that was definitely working poor and, you know, just trying to find myself, you know, over the years and things happen because life is not a straight line and things happen nope, and, definitely you know, not working to, you know, sure up my, my, my family's financial future, made a lot of mistakes, you know, along the way, or what I would like to say is my lived experience is ripe with ups and downs. Yeah. You know, and I just want people to know that we're to air is human. I think uh, somebody said to air is human and we all uh, have lived experiences. Uh, sometimes they're pure mistakes. Sometimes they're mistakes just because you took a risk. Yeah. And so, you know, those things happen to me along uh, along the way. And as I look back on those, I, I have grown so much from those painful lived experiences. And it has made me a better person, better able to do, you know, certain things, whether it's, you know, financially, spiritually, you know, you just grow in right. a moment. It, it hurts. But I, I want people to know we can't wallow in that. Nobody is perfect. And I mean, nobody, nobody. Is perfect, but it is how you come out of that struggle, what you glean from it and how you use the pain, the challenge or the difficulty to set you up to do a thing in a different way. Yeah, no, I agree. Okay, what advice would you give your younger self and what advice would you ignore? I would say, girl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is going to be a hard, exciting journey, but you are built for this moment. You really are, you're gonna get through it. And the other is to, to be yourself. You know, it took me a while to really center into who I am. And that's why I think maturity comes with really knowing, you know what, I'm grown. I have agency and I can speak my truth. Yeah. It is, I would say to my younger self, don't let anybody talk you out of being uniquely who you are and speaking your truth. And I will say to you as growing up, you know, in the eighties, you know, coming up, you know, I, I was born in the late sixties and, you know, coming of age in the 70s. I'm still in high school, you know, I'm in high school during the 80s. Right. And the whole colorism I want to throw out there yeah. really hit my generation really yeah. hard. And I am that bubbling brown skin sister, dark chocolate sister that really- Proud of it. Soak it all up. Endure, right? You know, not just racism or anti-blackness from a systemic perspective, but also what colorism does uh, to really kind of cloud for, for me, and I've talked to lots of darker skinned people who have endured this too, but your sense of who you are, your, yeah, beauty, absolutely. your, your worth. And I had to navigate those growing pains. And my mother, and, and you've heard me tell this story before, you know, died at the young age of 42 years old, but my mother was lighter skinned. You know, she was considered a red bone. And I, I do remember my mother just trying to pour it into me. But even when your parents lift you, they are not always able to protect you from the messages that come, you know, from outside forces yeah. and even like the commercials we would see and who we saw on TV. I must tell you that I wish 13 year old Nina had had the Black Panther. <laughs> yeah. And I've watched that movie. I literally watched that movie at least five or six times a year, if not more, not because of how it positions our Absolutely. people. Yep. Number one and two the beautiful rainbow that is blackness yeah shown in that that's, movie. that's awesome uh two more two more questions uh you have a committee of three living or dead to advise you on politics life business personal who would those three people be why and why God, bro, i hate to only three jesus get three well may 19th Today that we are talking is Minister Malcolm X's birthday. Oh, it is. I didn't even know that. That's yes, good to know. Yeah. I would I think he would be 96 years old if he were still alive. Yeah. He would definitely be on my committee for sure. Why? Because Minister Malcolm X spoke a certain truth that really resonated with urban blacks, with black people in cities. Like no one else. Like nobody else. And 
I do believe, you know, that 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 he had to understand. I mean, he critiqued this system truly, and it was. He a did. Hard- and by the way, just so you know, one of my one of my um, uh, goals is to really create a whole docu series, like a whole like well, actually, a, a, some dramatization of his experience through his life, because I think it's he had lived such a he lived such an interesting life, and he was certainly no other person spoke to urban the urban black experience like Malcolm X and no one else lived it to the way he did. But and, and, Go ahead. Yeah. That's, Oh my God. I'm so excited that you're doing that. Yes. that that's some years in the future. I got a few other things to do, but that's yeah. going to be, that's coming. <laughs> I love, I love, I love that you're doing that. So please, if I could be helpful in any way, um, let me know. But you know, he has a quote and this is not verbatim where he said, you know, I'm for, I'm for truth. Yep. No matter who is for or who is against, or justice, no matter who is for, or who is against. And that's a powerful statement because that is. sometime you laying out <laughs> that you're going to yep. bump against some folks. Yep. That, so he would be on my committee. My maternal grandmother would definitely be on that committee. I mean, she is such a big reason as to why I do what I do and think the way that I think, although she only had a third grade education. She had what we call in the African-American community, mother wit. Yep. And uh, just a PhD in life. She was she was born in 1915, and just wow. a spectacularly wise woman. And the three bones story that I tell all yeah. the time. Yeah, you, you got you got you got you got you got to tell it. I mean, what what, yeah. what what's the story? It's the it's the wishbone jawbone, the backbone. And my grandmother would say that the wishbone is for hoping and praying because hope is the motivator, the dream is the driver. The jawbone is for lifting your voice and speaking a certain truth to power. I'm paraphrasing her on that. And then the backbone is for standing that you're going to go through a whole lot of stuff in this world. You can't have a test, a testimony without a test. You got to have a backbone to keep standing through it all. And, you know, that 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 Preach. story, people love it all over the country. It doesn't matter what. I remember age. that story. Yeah, I still remember it. Yeah. And I wish she was around to know how famous that story has become and how beloved. You know, you and I were talking about how to touch people. There's yeah. a universal language. I think that storytelling is one. Music is, is another. Absolutely. Storytelling is the other. And the other person, since you're blocking me down to three, I hate this. This is so hard. I would say Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, mm. unbought and unbossed. And that is really animates my run right now. Yeah. And, Comes increasingly hard as you laid out a very toxic environment, not necessarily coming from Republicans when you're in a primary, but coming from people who call themselves a Democrats and the forces that bear down on you if they don't want you to win. Her whole notion of being able to have the courage in 1972 when she did not have the support of the black political class, she didn't have the support of white feminists, they even went another direction. Imagine that. No, we can't imagine that. But her 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 tenacity and perseverance and just audacity to say, I see a need and I don't have to be saluted or uplifted by these people with these fancy titles. All I need are the people. And this is why I am running and I am unbought and unbossed. That's um, my committee. That's it. That's it. That's a good committee. This You kind of answered my last question, but you may answer it differently. Good. If you have a, a if you had a theme in life or saying a billboard, what would that say and why? Yeah, I, well, it doesn't get any better than unbought and unbossed. Yep. Really- <laughs> I thought you I thought you you kind of answered the question with the how you answered the last question, uh, Senator Turner. Uh, you know, good luck in your race. I'm I'm really inspired by you and all that you're doing, and I just want to thank you for taking the time to be to to be with us today. Thank you. It was a pleasure joining you. Please have me back. Good luck in all that you're doing. And I'm looking forward to what that project you're going to do about Minister Malcolm X. And I will have you back. I promise that. 